the long day stretched into nights, and time crept onward towards the new day. With the first gold of dawn came a resurrection, a new hope that grew with a rising sun and went out to a waiting world. Welcome to this week's Coal, Iron, Lime and a bit of Gospel. This is the edition for Easter Day. I'm alongside the Worcester and Birmingham Canal in South Birmingham. And alongside that is also the railway line, which runs in a southwesterly direction, taking trains beyond Longbridge, down to Worcester and beyond to Bristol, Cardiff and even Plymouth. Our theme today is a very seasonal one, and that's reflected also in our opening prayer. Let us pray. Risen Christ, who calls us to walk in love, touch our lives with hope. Give us courage to believe and fill us with joy at the good news that you have overcome death and opened for us the way to eternal life. Amen. In 1824, John Cadbury, a Quaker, set up a business in Birmingham Town Centre. In Bull Street, he sold tea and coffee and hot chocolate. The business began to thrive. And in 1831, he decided to concentrate on the manufacture of cocoa and hot chocolate. To do so, he moved his premises from Bull Street to Bridge Street. Bridge Street is still there and runs between Broad Street and Holiday Street, just opposite the City Library where we've been a couple of times. Business was a little bit touch and go and there was one point when it almost folded. But John was joined in his business by his brother and in 1847 the chocolate industry made a big step forward. Fry's in Bristol, another Quaker family, invented, if you like, the chocolate bar. And Cadbury's followed two years later in 1849. Richard and George Cadbury were in charge of the business by 1861. And by then it was really beginning to boom. And so it was that in the 1870s, they started to look for a new place to build a factory. They took the very unusual step of not building in the already industrial area, but going out to the southwest of Birmingham onto a greenfield site. There, alongside the Bourne Brook, they built their new chocolate factory. And to give it a bit of panache, they chose a name with some French overtones. Instead of Bourne Brook, they would call it Bourneville. Cabris chose the Bourne Brook site because of the adjacent canal, which allowed cocoa beans, etc., to be bought from the ports, and also milk to be brought down from Staffordshire and up from Worcestershire. It was also alongside the railway line at a station that was then known as Sturchley Street. It's now known as Bourneville, and as you can probably see behind me, it's painted in Cadbury's purple. The original offices on the Bourneville site still stand within the centre of the development. But it was before Cadbury's moved here to Bourneville that they developed their first Easter egg. But they weren't the ones to introduce the Easter egg to the UK. Once again, Fry's down in Bristol had beaten them to it by producing an Easter egg by 1873. But Cadbury's developed a mechanism to mould the cocoa butter that goes into chocolate. They realised that if you poured it into a mould and then rotated the mould while the chocolate was setting inside, you could produce hollow eggs. And that's what Cadbury did by 1875. Easter eggs became immensely popular. And by 1893, Cadbury's were producing 19 different varieties of Easter egg. In 1909, 
Cadbury's acquired Fry's. But they continued to trade with the Fry's name until towards the end of the 20th century. But it made Cadbury's undoubtedly the biggest producer of Easter eggs within the United Kingdom. But why Easter eggs? Well, with Cadbury's development of the hollow egg, the symbolism of breaking open a chocolate egg to reveal the empty insides is symbolic of the breaking open of the stone that sealed the tomb of Jesus after the crucifixion. We're going to hear the Gospel reading now presented by the Reverend Phil Summers, and it comes from Matthew's Gospel, which tells us that the Roman authorities had set a guard on the tomb, a guard of soldiers. What happened next is the resurrection, an amazing story of God's love being stronger than death. After the Sabbath, at about dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and, and the other Mary, they went to the tomb. Well, suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down and he moved the stone away and he sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes shone like snow. The, the guards there were terrified. They shook and then became like dead men. He spoke to the women saying, do not be afraid. You are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He has been raised. Come and see the place where he was laid. Then go and say to his disciples that he has been raised from the dead and they are to go to Galilee and he will meet them there. The women came from the tomb filled with fear and joy and they went quickly to tell the disciples. And suddenly, Jesus met them. He said, greetings, and they came forward and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Do not be afraid, he said, but go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. I will meet them there. For centuries, indeed for millennia, eggs have been associated with the idea of new life, for obvious reasons. Going back 60,000 years, there is evidence of eggs being used in a practical sense to sustain life too. In the Kalahari Desert, fragments of decorated ostrich eggs have been discovered. And there's evidence that those ostrich eggs were emptied and then used as water flasks. Water, the very substance of life in the desert. Inscribed and decorated eggs were also found 5,000 years ago because they've been found in tombs dating from that period from the Egyptian and Mesopotamian civilizations of that day. This continued into the Christian era, one example being this ostrich egg from Ethiopia which has a candle inside it, so it functions as an icon of Jesus Christ. Back in the very earliest years of the Christian church, eggs were already symbols of new life. And in the Mesopotamian church in the second or third century, eggs were sometimes painted or decorated red to represent the blood of Christ. When the idea of fasting during the Lent period began to take shape. Eggs were one of the foods that was restricted during Lent, so the consumption of eggs became associated with Easter. Many different ways in which eggs are associated with rebirth, with new life and with the resurrected Christ. In Goa in India, Easter eggs are made out of marzipan and then of course the there are the elaborate Fabergé eggs from Russia. Jeweled eggs, which when you open them up, contain fantastic Easter gifts. All these are just different examples 
of how the egg has become associated with Easter. Eggs have also found a place within the more formal setting of the church. In the early 17th century, a prayer was added to the Roman ritual, the Book of Services and Prayers, a prayer of blessing for eggs at Easter tide. Also, an egg can be used as an illustration of the Christian doctrine of the Trinity, one God known as Father, Son and Holy Spirit, one egg comprising shell, albumin and yolk. But going back to the idea of chocolate eggs, they weren't a British invention. In fact, in the 17th century, at the court of Louis XIV at Versailles, chocolate eggs were known. And in Turin, in what is now northern Italy, an enterprising trader had realised that she could fill empty chicken eggs with chocolate and make them a treat for young and old alike. Here, though, is very much the home of the chocolate Easter egg at Bourneville, at Cadbury's. The Cadbury family, a family of Quakers, are no longer involved in the business. It's now run by Mondeley. And the tourist attraction, Cadbury World, has now been taken over by Merlin, who also run attractions such as Warwick Castle and the Sea Life Centres and Alton Towers. But the Cadbury factory, the Cadbury family, are still exercising their Quaker faith. They're still involved, for example, with Bourneville Village Trust. Because after establishing the factory here, Cadbury's also built the garden village that is known as Bourneville. They provided recreational facilities such as swimming baths, playing fields, where I'm recording this segment of the reflection, libraries, schools, churches, and even a great carillon, which plays tunes on bells on special occasions. One of those occasions, of course, will be this coming Sunday, Easter Day, when we pronounce, Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. God, we thank you for the gift of Easter eggs, a sign of new life and of Christ's resurrection. May the joy of Easter be a reminder of the joy we have in you, now and always, through Christ's death and resurrection. Christ is risen. Alleluia. Amen. So you have plenty of symbolism when you tuck into your Easter eggs. Break open the egg, like breaking open the empty tomb. The egg also represents the stone that had been rolled across the tomb. And also, of course, that symbol of new life. And even as you tuck into your boiled egg in the morning, you got the shell, the white and the yolk, the trinity of Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Thank you for being part of this reflection this week. There won't be a reflection next week, but I'll be back in two weeks' time. In the meantime, take care, stay safe and remember that the best of all, God is with us.